yellow here and red here, but this piece will still be in the same place so that I can put P1 here or P2 here, similarly, right? So that's just for example, not solving the cube, but as you can see, I flipped it. Now red is here and yellow is here. This is not what it's supposed to be, but just as an example, right? So this stuff works. There's no question that this works. Okay, so properties now, P1, P2, P3, and R, are secondary properties that is attributable to the group, right? So the quadrants are fixed. They are inflexible. But the property allocation to a specific quadrant is flexible. Okay. Now, think about what I was able to do with the cube, and imagine that you were uh, a social scientist assessing um, particular demographic uh, identifiers within a community. Right? The community itself, property fixed, identifiers within the community flexible. You could design some really cool um, measuring scalable techniques implementing a system like this. You can complicate this system by incorporating statistical analysis and so on, right? But I'm not here to do that. I just want to give you sort of the foundational account. That's what logicians do. We don't really do anything else, really. <laughs> and I'm not a logician, and this isn't really logic. All right, this is critical thinking. So let's look at gamma so that we really have an understanding of what's going on in gamma. Uh, gamma's here. So if I was to describe this relationship in gamma, I would say that this P1 is in position P1.1. Property 1 is in location or quadrant 1. Property 1 is in quadrant 1. Property 1 is in quadrant 2, right? P1.2. Property 1 is in quadrant 3. P1 is in 3. Property 1 is in quadrant 4. P1-4. So we have a property on property, right? This is a property. Well, this is the inherent property, right? Quadrant 1 is inherent. Our primary. Property 2 is contingent or secondary. They're both properties, so together they create a meta property. So this is a meta property. Obviously, this is a deeper level of analogical relation, relational assessment than just P1. Right, P1.1, P1.2, P1.3, P1.4, deeper analogical relational analysis than just P1, because we're talking about meta properties, properties of property stuff. And the example of the Rubik's Cube that I just showed you is a demonstration of that proof. And if you want to watch the video, it's, I think it's a pretty freaking amazing video myself. <laughs> Not to toot my own horn, but it's pretty cool. All right, so that's that. Um, so if we look at delta now, if we look at delta, we, how are we going to identify this? We would say that this is R1, property R in quadrant 1. one. This is P32, 1, 2, 3, 4. P32, this is P1, 3, and this is P1, 4. Right? So uh, R.1, P3.2, P1.3, P1.4. If you understand that now, you can see that this is far more technical than the last analysis because the last analysis I was presuming that, well, you know, the, the group exhibited a particular property, P1, um, and it was related in a positive analogical relationship to group delta if delta had P1. But now we can go even further and say, well, no, it has to be in a particular location for it to have that positive analogical relationship. And, um, and complicate the analysis even more. Okay, so now what we're going to do is actually play, begin to play the game. Uh, all of this analysis, to be honest with you, it's just been a very, very long, it's actually a pretty difficult lecture to have, keeping me on my toes. Critical thinking is not a game, right? Um, all of this has been just me very meticulously, hopefully, trying to establish a logical structure so that you can make sense of how the game is played. We haven't even begun to play the game. All of this is just sort of preconditioned to understanding the rules of this particular game. This game can be applied and complicated many, many times over. I think that for me, and I'm not saying that this is the case, I'd entertain and encourage other scholars to look at my research and see what you can do 
to complicate it yourself. I was able to use this heuristic modeling to solve the Rubik's Cube in a uniquely new way. Um, and you can look at that demonstration on the link that I've provided, so there's no question that this works. Um, it's, it's a lot that you can do with this, I think. And I, it, it would just be really cool, I think, to make the, I think it's really cool to make the contribution. Um, I think it's really cool that this contribution could help other people develop more complex um, measures, uh, heuristic models. So that's just that. So let's look at the analogical relations with meta properties, right? Let's look at the analogical relations. with meta properties. Okay, so we're going to draw the groups again. One, two, three. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Okay, we have P1, P1, P2, P1, P3, P3, uh, P1, R, R. Okay, so we draw the group. Should make the lines more defined so we can see where each group starts and stops. Okay. Alright, so let's look at alpha. Now we're going to complicate the analysis of alpha before. What you can do is on your own look at um, the first description of alpha when we weren't looking at meta prop, uh, a meta um, property analysis of these analogical relationships and then look at the complication that we've introduced by looking at sort of quadrant specific analysis. Okay, so I'm not going to write this down, it's too long, but one, alpha has a positive analogical relation ship with beta. Alpha has a positive, that beta looks terrible. Alpha has a positive analogical relationship with beta, right? And gamma, with respect to P1, right? They both share, it has a positive, alpha has a positive analogical relationship with respect to beta and gamma. If I'm now uh, analyzing P1, and beta, and only beta with respect to P1.1, right? The reason why I'm doing this is because you're going to need to really be able to conceptualize this, right? There is a positive analogical relationship of the secondary property P1 between beta and gamma and alpha. There's P1, there's P1, there's P1. However, this P1 is in location 2, so technically if we're looking at a meta level, this is P1.2. There's no P1.2 here, so it shares positive analogical relationship with respect to P1 for beta and gamma because the group possesses both P1, but only with respect to beta for P1.1. So to read that again, and I think that should be clear. If you're following me at this point, that should be clear. I can't make that any simpler. Alpha has a positive analogical relation with beta and gamma with respect to P1, but only uh, beta with respect to P1.1. P1.1 being our meta property uh, identification. Okay, two. Alpha has a positive analogical relationship with beta, positive analogical relationship with beta with respect to P2.3. P2, quadrant 3, P2.3, P2, 1, 2, 3, quadrant 3, exactly in the exact same place, right? So now we recognize that we're talking about meta properties, right? Obviously if it shares properties, um, obviously if it shares properties and meta properties, then we know that it's in exactly the same position. We're not just saying that it shares property, we're saying it shares property and meta properties, it's exactly the same position. Okay, cool. Number three, alpha has a negative analogical relationship with respect to beta and gamma, beta and gamma, when we're analyzing P3, P3. P3 is shared by beta and gamma, it's absent in alpha, right? There is no P3 in gamma. So we see that um, beta and gamma have P3, alpha 